Hello, History 17B, Autumn Quarter 2023. I always feel a little bit like an airline person as I do this. Take a moment to notice the exit nearest you, remembering that it might be to your rear. I am going to reiterate what I said at the very beginning of Lecture 4. The decades after the American Civil War saw the United States grow in every conceivable dimension. Geographic extent, population, immigration, urbanization, industrialization, communications, transportation. The U.S. was growing exponentially in all of these. The Northeast and the Great Lakes region saw the greatest intensity in industrialization, urbanization, and immigration across the Atlantic from Europe. The rosy view of the 20th century transformed the idea of the American melting pot into a lovely harmless soup or fondue where everything and everyone blended together to make a wonderful mix. This represented pride in a quite limited Euro-American version of diversity that came with post-World War optimism. This is very much not what 19th century white Americans meant by a melting pot. This is what white 19th century industrial era Americans had in mind when they said melting pot. What you are looking at pouring out on the left side is molten or melted metal. Steel was practically emblematic of the industrial era in America, not just iron, but steel. It was used for railroad tracks, allowing them to be built across the continent. It was used in building the steam engines that drew the trains along the tracks. Steel was used in the place of wood to build frameworks of buildings, making skyscrapers for the cities of the future. Steel also revolutionized corsetry. And if you are interested in that, stay tuned for the coda. Steel was superior to so-called pig iron used previously because it had no impurities. And it had no impurities because they were burned off in this whopping big, insanely hot cauldron or crucible or melting pot. This image includes doors here and walkways. So you can see just how massive these steel works were. The idea of the melting pot was that the people who immigrated from Europe to work in factories like this would have the features that were considered undesirable, like being Catholic, burnt off in the molten steel of America, leaving them as good white citizens who fit in. Notice the white part there. We will be looking at immigration from Asia to the west coast of North America in another lecture. White Americans considered Asian immigrants too far outside of what could be considered American for even this process to make them acceptable citizens to the white U.S. government. In this lecture, we will be looking at the growth of industry in the Northeast and Great Lakes region of the U.S., the profits that the industry made for some, the people who did the actual labor, and the beginnings of solid labor activism in the U.S. I should say here that this is one of those lectures that became longer than I had hoped. So this is only part one of lecture five. The U.S. initially lagged behind Europe in what is considered the second industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution had included things like water-powered textile mills. The second industrial revolution pressed newly burgeoning theoretical science into the service of practical applications. U.S. businessmen turned out to have a certain skill and ruthlessness when it came to applying the sort of scientific research emerging in European universities to industrial markets. By the turn of the century, more than 150 U.S. companies, including U.S. Steel, DuPont, and Standard Oil, had opened research facilities staffed by foreign scientists. These turned theoretical innovations in chemistry, engineering, and physics into big money makers for folks like 
Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, and J.P. Morgan. These companies also engaged in patent trolling, meaning buying up new patents so that no one else could use them. This is a practice that is still popular. A patent is basically a license for an invention. This is intended to protect the inventor, but corporations had the money to take greater advantage of the patent system than the actual inventors in many cases. On this slide is a chart which shows the rise in patents issued between 1830 and 1910. And notice that these are in 5,000 year increments if you look at the vertical axis. Some of the inventions were pretty much worthless, but others like the Edison light bulb and modifications to improve steam engines would be hugely profitable. Electricity made major changes in places where it spread. Edison was not the sole inventor of the light bulb. There were other designs that came out across Europe and the U.S. Edison's genius was in making the bulb commercially successful by creating a functioning electrical system in New York City in 1882. Streetlights, factories, wealthy homes all used light bulbs marketed by Edison that ran on electricity. Prior to electric light, you had a flame fed either by candles or gas lamps. Natural gas is still used in stoves, and as you may know, it is both poisonous and explosive if it leaks out without being burnt off. Gas lamps also had to be lit by hand, as you see with the lamp lighter on the right. And although gas produces more light than candles and outside the reach of firelight from a hearth, it is much less effective than the incandescent light bulb. By 1887, the U.S. had 121 generating plants distributing electricity through Edison's direct current or DC system. Direct current transmits electricity at more or less constant voltages, limiting the number of places that can be served from one source and the distances electricity can be distributed across. George Westinghouse, whose name you may recognize from a brand that still exists, developed alternating current, or AC, which basically can transmit electricity long distances at high voltage and then transform it to low voltage for use in cities, factories, and homes. The example that you see here is from my own research. This is the old Hemingway Gymnasium at Harvard University, old because it has been torn down and replaced with a very much less interesting building. Hemingway was one of the first large gymnasia in the U.S., and it was built before electricity, although not that long before. You can see all of the big windows to let in daylight, but you can also imagine that the amount of light would be affected by weather and time of year. In the evening, it would be gas lights that had to be lit by hand, had flame in a space filled with flammable material, and whose light was largely swallowed up in the massive space. I've read letters dealing with the installation of electricity in the gym. They show a mixture of irritation in the interruption of regular workings, but also excitement at the idea of the fantastically greater use to which the gymnasium could be put. This is a sort of day-to-day on-the-ground change that we overlook sometimes when we focus on the big names like Edison and Westinghouse. That said, I am about to look at Andrew Carnegie's steel manufacturing and the corporate culture of America in the 19th century. The American ideal of the self-made businessman rests on conditions particular to a rather narrow historical context. The 18th century had been typified, the 18th century, so we're talking 1700s now, had been typified by what's called merchant capitalism, basically buying, shipping, and selling goods that were generally made by hand in artisans' workshops or cottage industries. With the 19th century, a global market, surplus labor, and the expansion of the U.S. technologically and geographically made it possible for 
industrial capitalism in which all enterprises are privately owned to become the dominant, if not only, system in the U.S. The men, and they were all men for legal reasons, who were able to take advantage of this transition became fabulously wealthy. And we recognize many of their names now. J.P. Morgan, Vanderbilt, Rockefeller, Henry Ford, and Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie was one of the American businessmen who made use of science and technology from Europe. Our old friend from France's time in Mexico here on the left, Napoleon III was griping on one occasion that armaments had to be made out of pig iron, which was brittle because of the impurities in it, and did things like exploding on the people firing the weapons rather than on enemy troops. Steel at the time could only be made in small amounts. It was expensive and not suitable for outfitting a large army. In 1856, Englishman Sir Henry Bessemer patented a process named after him, which rid pig iron of its impurities. And you may recognize the melting pot in this slide here as part of the Bessemer process. Steel produced by this process was stronger, cheaper, and easier to manufacture than steel had ever been before. Although hopefully you could tell from the image, easier did not mean easy nor safe for those actually doing the labor. Remember, in Europe, the Bessemer process came into use in the 1850s. It was 1873 when Andrew Carnegie introduced the Bessemer process into his steelworks in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This picture was taken later, but you still get a reasonable idea of what living and working in these places must have been like. And you can also see the proximity of the steelworks, and people's houses for that matter, to the railroad. Paved roads were not really a thing yet, and there were certainly no interstate highways. Anything that moved long distances was literally shipped using ships over rivers or lakes or oceans or transported by rails, by rails over land. You can imagine the limitations this put on shipping anything perishable, like meat or milk. It was a big deal when Gustavus Swift developed an early version of the ice-cooled rail car between 1878 and 1880. People could ship cuts of meat rather than entire living cows. The Swift name is still a brand that produces meat products. You might also notice how many names of businessmen are still around as brand names or building names, like Carnegie Hall. Returning to Andrew Carnegie, he did not invent anything like light bulbs or refrigeration, but he was a leading figure in industrial capitalism and marketing. He was one of the pioneers of vertical integration, or as it's labeled in the image here, vertical consolidation. This means that his company controlled the entire supply chain from extraction of natural resources through production to marketing and sales. Vertical integration was great for efficiency and for profits for people in Carnegie's position, not so much for anyone else. Carnegie could save money by controlling how much people in each level would be paid, and it was never generous. Supposedly, the savings were passed on to consumers, but most of the savings extracted from laborers went into profits for those who owned the companies. John D. Rockefeller turned to horizontal integration. Horizontal integration is the consolidation of production of a particular consumer good in the hands of an individual or small group. The end point of horizontal integration is monopoly. The group that monopolizes production of a good can crank up prices as high as they would like because there is no competition with them in the market. In practice, horizontal integration does not require a complete monopoly to be hugely profitable to owners and to make those profits at the expense of consumers. John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil owned 
88% of all oil refining facilities, which gave him control of prices and profits for all practical purposes. Rockefeller used his mammoth profits to increase those mammoth profits by creating a holding company. This allowed Standard Oil to control many other corporations, cutting competition and increasing profits for those with enough money to buy shares in the company. And you can see that this cartoon from the era suggests that control of industry and huge profits also meant having a disproportionate influence on the U.S. federal government, state governments too, for that matter. This became part of a pattern in which it took money to make money and a trend toward both greater income inequality and a pattern of economic boom bust cycles. But I am going to move away from that at the moment to focus on the folks who supplied the labor on which Carnegie and Rockefeller depended. It was not just the U.S. that was industrializing. And the transition from a system of serfdom or peasantry, and I am going to generalize across Europe here, to industry and large-scale agriculture uprooted many people around the world. I like to use England as an example because I'm more comfortable with English history than, say, German or Eastern European, but also because English law has had the greatest influence on American law. The specifics of what I am going to describe in the next couple of slides are for England, but the general pattern of the displacement of people who had worked farming the same land for generations was a through line that can be seen across regions. If you have never seen the film Monty Python and the Holy Grail, I'm really not sure whether I should recommend it or not. There are parts of it that I cannot watch because they reflect what was forward thinking and edgy in the 1970s, but is pretty much appalling and cringe inducing now, particularly when it comes to gender. On the other hand, during the 1980s and into the 1990s, it was a cult film. And some parts of the movie are still terribly funny, especially to those of us who were around for the Thatcher years. Those would be the Reagan years in the U.S. The film came out at a time when Great Britain was experiencing serious class conflict and labor protests. The Monty Python group was poking fun at the idea that England was built on any sort of ideas of equality. But it is true that from 1542, Parliament in the House of Commons included what were called local representatives. Let's look more closely at what local representative and commons mean or meant in this usage. Sounds like everyone gets a say in government, right? Not so much universal manhood suffrage, and man does mean identified as male here, universal manhood suffrage would not exist in Great Britain until the fourth and final Reform Act, the Reform Act of 1918. So before 1918, who got to be a local representative and who got to elect the local representative? The salient factor was land ownership, independence. Remember that I am generalizing and simplifying in all of these lectures. Prior to the late 16th century, land in England was owned by the aristocracy and farmed by the peasant class. No saying government for the peasants, but in theory, their lord was supposed to look after them. This was somewhat more likely when the production of the lord's estate depended on not dead labor. Before the late 16th century, some areas of land on an estate were designated as commons, meaning that everyone could make use of that land to help with their survival. So you see this system for Appleby over on the left. There's a village, there's a bigger house, there's strips of land that are farmed by the peasants. Some of those would be commons, and then there are little bits of land that belong to this village down here, and there's a little bit more villagey stuff over here. Beginning in the late 16th century and continuing in fits and starts through the 18th century, 
changes in agriculture and farming meant that landowners could produce more with fewer laborers. Landlords, still largely aristocracy, but beginning to include wealthy farmers and merchants, these landowners evicted small farmers and began to fence in large tracts of land, including commons, as their personal property. This is called enclosure because farming came to be associated with privately owned, fenced in, or enclosed fields. So on the right hand image, this is Appleby enclosures. You can see the enclosure line all the way around. You can see it includes Crosswell Field and Norton Hedge Field and the Great Heath, all of that. And even more, the villages in the common land are gone. As a result of enclosure, many of the people who had done the farming were forced off of agricultural land. They flooded into cities, especially London. Laborers could no longer grow their own food and had to try to figure out other ways to survive. But economies and industrial production, such as it was, were not able to incorporate this surplus of people. In order to avoid being imprisoned or hanged for poverty or sent to the workhouse, many of these people migrated to North America as British colonists. So not necessarily the ones who came in the first wave, but in sort of the 1.2 wave. But let's fast forward now to the time period of our class. The descendants of the paupers we were just looking at by the 19th century, the 1800s, viewed themselves as native-born Americans. England transitioned to enclosure, large-scale farming, and industry earlier than other places in Europe. But by the time period of our class, just after the American Civil War, the U.S. experienced an influx of what white Americans considered to be new immigrants. These people came largely from Southern and Eastern Europe and from Ireland. And people who considered themselves native-born white Americans did not consider these incoming Europeans to be equal, although their labor was welcome in industry. When 19th century Americans talked about the melting pot, these were the people who could be turned into proper Americans in the eyes of white U.S. government. Black people were not included in the melting pot, and despite citizenship and generations living in the U.S., they were largely treated in both white politics and society as outsiders. I'll talk about immigration from Asia in another lecture in Module B, but I have seen from timelines that many of you are familiar with the Chinese Exclusion Act, which did just what it sounds like, and along with other laws, excluded people from Asia. Only folks from Europe could be put in the big industrial melting pot and have their impurities burned out enough to supposedly become true Americans. Before I go on, I want to say the image here, these people aren't packed together temporarily because the ship was coming into harbor. This is how they traveled. Poor immigrants who crossed oceans to North America traveled in what was called, what is still called, steerage, although it's not quite so bad as it used to be, I don't think. Basically, their ticket got them onto the boat and nothing else. Once you boarded, you needed to stay out of the way of sailors and any wealthy folks who happened to be on board. But otherwise, you were left to shift for yourself. Steerage could be above deck, as on the left, or below deck, on the right. But either way, there was not much in the way of amenities, like surfaces to sleep on or toilets. If you came across the Atlantic to the east coast of the United States, then you were processed through Ellis Island. You spend a lot of time in lines being assessed by immigration agents, and you might be sent back to Europe for any number of reasons. Eye disease, sub suspected tuberculosis, or looking shifty. If you were male, but didn't look masculine enough, you were suspect because you might end up being a so-called burden on the state and not a good industrial worker. 
if you were a young woman traveling alone, you might be sent back if the immigration agent decided that you were likely to become a prostitute. Nonetheless, many immigrants from Europe were admitted because they provided cheap labor in industry, and that included women and children. There was no sitting around making the domestic space a peaceful retreat for your husband. You all worked, but if you were a woman, you got paid less. If immigrant labor was so valuable, what impurities did white Americans in the U.S. object to and want to have either prohibited or burnt off in the melting pot? Italian immigrants had a couple of strikes against them. They didn't speak English and they were Catholic, not Protestant. And although Italian families did immigrate to the U.S., a disproportionate number of Italian immigrants in the 19th century were young men who had no intention nor desire to stay and become Americans. They wanted to earn money and take that money back to Italy. Irish immigrants generally came as families because all of them were starving in Ireland. It did not make sense to leave anyone behind to die while you earned money for them in America. Irish immigrants also spoke English, but like the Italians, they were Catholic and not Protestant. Eastern European immigrants did not speak English, and they weren't just not Protestant, they were not Christian. Many Eastern European Jews came to the U.S. at the time to escape pogroms. Pogroms were organized massacres of Jewish people. There was another annoying thing to white Americans about European immigrants, and you see that in this slide here in the banners that the young women are wearing. Labor organized in Europe early, and many of these people brought ideas of workers' rights to the U.S. with them. It was not as if folks born in America would not have turned to unions or organized labor without European immigrants. But many European workers came with both practice in organizing industrial labor and theory that linked them together beyond being maltreated workers. We will talk more about anarchism, socialism, and labor in a later module when we get to things like McKinley's assassination and the first Red Scare. In the meantime, though, I'd like to point out that in strict theory, anarchism, syndicalism, and socialism are different things. On the ground, in the late 19th to 20th century, and now for that matter, many people on all sides failed to make any distinction. So anarchism is political theory that advocates a stateless society governed by independent and autonomous communities. Syndicalism is political theory associated with anarchism that advocated organizing governments around syndicates or confederations rather than a central government. Socialism is different. It advocates a central government, but makes the main job of the central government the welfare of people on the ground, rather than the protection of an idea of free market and property. Europe had a history of extreme violence, and to many folks struggling in Europe, answering violence with violence seemed to be a reasonable course of action. These images are from the Paris Commune of 1871, a brief takeover of the French government by anarchists and or socialists. Americans weren't quite sure, but anyway, folks with radical ideas about politics and labor. I have absolutely no intention here of weighing it on French history. My point is that this is the sort of imagery that you see on the slide that Americans saw in their newspapers. The obvious association with violence in Europe made it increasingly easy for politicians and business owners in the U.S. to associate both labor agitation and European immigrants with scary events in Europe generally. This tended to undermine any productive discussion of the rights and treatment of the industrial labor force in the U.S. Any hope of rational discussion often began and ended with vilification. And to be honest, there were enough violence-prone radicals in the U.S. 
to make maligning all labor organizations easier for those who wanted to undermine labor actions. I briefly mentioned boom-bust cycles earlier, but I'll come back to them briefly now. Many people have heard of the Wall Street crash of 1929 and the Great Depression of the 1930s. These were part of a pattern of industrial economies that started earlier and that was one factor in World War I. I've given you two different definitions of boom-bust cycles that say essentially the same thing in different ways. So economic process typified by expanding and then contracting business activity that typified the U.S. and European economies in the late 19th century. Or cycles of prosperity and depression that destabilized the global economy in the late 19th century. Either way that you think about it, the important thing to us here is that it was not the U.S. economy isolated by itself. These booms and busts came in the context of the interplay of European and American banking. The second point is that on both sides of the Atlantic, the upshot of industrialization with capital and the boom-bust cycle increased wealth inequality dramatically. The Panic of 1893 will show up later, but going back to the Panic of 1873, it was followed three years later by the extremely contentious election of 1876. I mentioned this briefly as marking the end of Reconstruction and the abandonment of the South to Jim Crow. But I want to come back to it now, because although the election was made under the shadow of the South and had huge implications for the South, many American voters in their day-to-day -day lives had other things on their mind. This is a quick reminder of how the political parties stood going into the 1876 presidential election. The Democrats were mainly white Americans born in the U.S., living in the South. And this part is going to become more important in this lecture, some European immigrants in the Northeast. These people were generally fine with the enslavement of other people, and they were also anti-tariff. Republicans were mainly white Americans born in the U.S., and living in the Northeast and Black Americans. They tended to be anti-enslavement and also often pro-tariff. And I've left the radical Republicans there, but you know that they, they lost the battle. This is what the party candidates looked like on paper in 1876. The Democrat on the left here was Samuel J. Tilden. He was governor of New York, and he was seen as a big figure in anti-corruption, anti-political corruption in particular here. On the right, you have the Republican Rutherford B. Hayes. He was governor of Ohio. He was a Civil War general for the Federal Army, and he was conciliatory or, you know, easy on Southern whites. Looking at the 1876 election, you can see that the Democrats down here got a greater share of the popular vote. And this included in New York State up here. You might reasonably wonder why New York would side against its own governor. Remember that I said Tilden was noted as anti-corruption. The corruption that he went after involved politicians who had actually provided support and services to European immigrants who had become American voters. These people were not best pleased with Tilden. Meanwhile, the Electoral College over here was a toss-up. And although the Greenback Party here won't be something we talk about, they did manage actually to get 1% of the popular vote. Third parties in U.S. politics are not a new thing. The big problem in the 1876 election came in deciding how to read the results from South Carolina, Louisiana, and Florida. 
these southern states still had a strong enough Republican presence to point out that an election that intimidated Black voters was not a fair election. After much anger and ill will, there was a quick last-minute backroom deal called the Compromise of 1877, and it basically was a political deal that resolved the disputed election of 1876 by ceding electoral votes to the Republican candidate Hayes in exchange for ending Reconstruction. We know the repercussions of this on the South. But the entire country felt that the election was questionable, if not outright illegitimate, and it left a certain amount of the population across the U.S. uneasy about American politics. From the 1873 panic, we're backing up a little bit here, but we will come up to 1877. From the 1873 panic, there had been strikes and labor agitation across the U.S., Big companies kept their profits at the expense of workers, reducing hours, cutting wages, and laying off employees. Small businesses, around 18,000 of them, just flat failed, leaving workers and former owners alike out on the street. This collapse of businesses included 89% of the nation's 364 railroad companies. And that's what this cartoon from the time period is showing you. You are looking at a guide to the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad published in 1874. That's on the left. And a reprint of lectures given to the employees of the B&O as the name was abbreviated. On the right, public lectures were a form of entertainment that could be sponsored by clubs, employers, or townships, and they were often popular. We talked about vaudeville, or maybe you looked at it. We talked about what entertainment was like before you had any sort of electronic anything, audio, video, anything. So these lectures that were included in the booklet on the right have nothing to do with railroad work. There is one on locomotion or movement in quadrupeds, for example, one on the structure of the spine and the skull, and one on fermentation, probably as applied to the beer industry. You can find these in the Library of Congress if you want to look up what more of the lectures were. Now, returning, the B&O Railroad was a railroad that survived the 1873 panic, but it did so in part by slashing employee pay, not once, but repeatedly. In July of 1877, workers at the B&O Railroad in West Virginia went on strike after the third in a series of pay cuts. B&O workers in Maryland stopped working and joined those in West Virginia to increase the power of the strike, and it worked. Shipping across the U.S. came to a halt, and the public noticed. Now, this doesn't mean that the public would have been sympathetic to the striking workers, but the newly elected president, Rutherford B. Hayes, called in the military, which he was busy withdrawing from the South, to quell what he characterized as an insurrection and a national threat. This is one of those places where we might consider the idea of free labor and the idea of an equitable bargaining position for employer and employee in creating contracts. At any rate, in Baltimore, federal troops fired on a crowd of protesters, injuring 40 and killing 11 outright. This was not a good look for Hayes in the eyes of either the public or struggling railroad workers. Within weeks, railroad workers in Pennsylvania, Illinois, and Missouri had gone on strike in sympathy. Hayes sent federal troops to Pittsburgh, where they opened fire on a crowd, including not just the striking workers, but their families. 20 people were killed at this time, including a woman and three small children. Pittsburgh did indeed see unrest, not just labor demands at that point, and striking workers set Pennsylvania Railroad on fire. The final body count at the end of 24 hours in Pittsburgh was close to 40. Five of those were soldiers, the remainder were residents of Pittsburgh. 
the railroad strike of 1877 ended without the railroad workers gaining concessions from the rail. This is a glass half empty or full situation, depending on your view or your personality. It did show that workers could organize large labor protests with far-reaching effects. It also made it look to people reading the news, as we see in this image, like striking workers were a violent mob bent on destruction rather than a group of workers trying to get better treatment in their jobs. As with lecture four, this lecture has turned out to be long. So I will break off here and talk about labor and unions more broadly than the railroads and touch on early populists in part two. The key points and the coda for all of lecture five will be at the end of part two.